Good afternoon. We are Michelle and Terry Wright, and we are the co-founders of the National Organization of African Americans with Cystic Fibrosis, also known as NORSEF. And it is our indeed honor to welcome you to today's inaugural BioMERGE, which stands for Blacks, Indigenous, and Other Minority Ethnicities with Rare and Genetic Disease Annual Conference, which is sponsored, as my husband said, by the National Organization of African Americans with Cystic Fibrosis, NOAA Cell. We also want to thank our distinguished NOAA Self board members in order that they will be appealing, uh, appearing in today's program. Beth Safian, uh, Dr. Amy Hester, Everett Rice, and Zipporah Seeley for their hard work in helping to bring this vision to reality alongside each of you for your continued support and attendance today. The BioMERGE conference coincides with Rare Disease Day, which is actually tomorrow, Sunday, February the 28th, as well as Black History Month. There are more than 7,000 different rare diseases collectively affecting more than 350 million people around the world. Ethnic and racial minorities may also experience a higher incidence and prevalence of rare diseases than the general population for a variety of reasons, genetic and otherwise. So indeed, racial and ethnic minorities and other underserved populations are likely to experience even greater barriers to screening, diagnosis and treatment of rare diseases than for common conditions due to a variety of cultural, socioeconomic, and environmental factors. NOACEF is confident that our annual BioMERGE conference will increase awareness of rare diseases in minority communities by focusing on one genetic disease and one rare disease every year. And this year, cystic fibrosis and systemic lupus erythematosus were selected due to the direct impact on both Terry and myself respectfully. We are also ecstatic to feature two phenomenal and nationally renowned speakers who are both national leaders in their um, specific fields. And that's Dr. Jennifer Teller Kauser, who will speak about cystic fibrosis and Dr. Jason K. Taylor, who will speak about lupus. And you are also in for a treat with our expert panel made up of healthcare professionals and people with cystic fibrosis and lupus who will share their unique experiences. So without further ado, let me pass the baton to our very own NOAA Self board member, Beth Safian, who is director of the CF Legal Information Hotline and director of the CL Social Security Project, and who has been practicing law for 30 years, who will now introduce our first esteemed speaker, Dr. Jennifer Taylor Kauser. Belle? Thank you, Michelle. I'm so happy to be here today and so inspired by the work you and Terry are doing to inform and help people with cystic fibrosis and lupus and other conditions. So we have two amazing speakers today and the NOACEF board is so grateful to them. Uh, we put together a special basket and Michelle wants me to show it. <laughs> Let's make sure I can um, get it. So we have this very special basket with the wonderful uh, Stacey Abrams with all sorts of treats. Uh, there's coffee, tea, chocolate, hot sauce, candles, honey, and uh, these very special handmade mugs. This is John Lewis, and obviously we have uh, Stacey Abrams, and these are very, very hard to get, um, and we thought they would be uh, nice for our speakers, and all of the items in the basket are from small minority-owned businesses, 
And of course, we encourage everybody when they can to support uh, small minority owned businesses who, of course, during the past year and COVID have, have taken uh, a big hit in terms of business. So we have searched out all these wonderful uh, places and you can see the Harlem Chocolate Factory. Uh, so, uh, so that's something special for our speakers. So our, uh, the other thing we would like you to know is we uh, are not, our captioning is not working. We tried it yesterday and it is not working and we are very sorry. We will offer a transcript uh, for those who would like it at the end of next week. So we are sorry that the captioning is not working. Our first speaker is Dr. Taylor Kauser. She is a pediatric and adult pulmonologist at National Jewish Health, where she serves as the Medical Director of Clinical Research Services, President-Elect for the Medical Staff, Co-Director of the Adult CF Center, and Co-Director of the Adult CF Program, and the Cystic Fibrosis Therapeutics Development Director. She is one of the leading CF researchers in the United States. She's a graduate of Stanford University, received her medical degree from Duke, um, and her Master of Clinical Science from University of Colorado in 2015. She has really almost another whole page of, of things that she does. We don't know when she sleeps, but uh, we in the CF community, we know that every person who lives with cystic fibrosis is better off thanks to Dr. Jennifer Taylor Kauser. And we are thankful for uh, her decision to dedicate her brilliance to the CF community. And so without further ado, here is Dr. Jennifer Taylor Kauser. Thanks very much for that very kind introduction, Beth. And thanks to Terry and Michelle for the invitation to speak to you today. I'm very excited to be here. So I'm gonna to talk to you about great strides and future directions in CF and making sure that no one is left behind. These are my disclosures, most of which are related to the fact that I am the primary investigator on many of our clinical trials here at National Jewish, and I do a lot of work for the CF Foundation. And here's what we'll talk about today. So the cause, diagnosis, epidemiology, and signs and symptoms of CF, the treatment of CF, and then the future of CF therapy. So back in 1938 was when the first pathologic description of cystic fibrosis occurred. And it was described by Dr. Dorothy Anderson, who actually wanted to be a surgeon, but they wouldn't let her back in the 1930s. So she became a pathologist. And fortunately for us, she described the disease that we know as cystic fibrosis. Unfortunately, it was from the autopsies that she was doing on children who had died from CF. What she described was cystic fibrosis of the pancreas that included mucus plugging of the glandular ducts and replacement of the pancreas by cysts and fibrosis. At that time, the prognosis was quite poor for children with cystic fibrosis. Families were basically told, take your child home and love them because they aren't going to live for very long. Then in 1943, Dr. Sidney Farber described the condition as mucoviscidosis a multi-system disorder in which the major manifestations are chronic bronchopulmonary infections, so infections of the airways of the lungs, malabsorption and steatorrhea, so greasy, smelly stools, and growth failure. Then in 1946, doctors Anderson and Hodges realized that it was a genetic disorder and that it was inherited in an autosomal recessive fashion, meaning you had to get one copy from your mom and one from your dad. Then in the 1950s is when the sweat test was described. There was a story that back in 1948, there was a heat wave in New York and Dr. Paul de St. Ignace noted that kids were coming in with CF with heat stroke. And so he hypothesized that probably there was something wrong with the sweat gland and then later described a high chloride in the sweat of people with CF. 
1959, Drs. Gibson and Cook then went on to standardize the sweat test where we stimulate the sweat gland and then measure the amount of chloride that's in the sweat gland. So a positive test, meaning that somebody definitely has CF, is over 60. So a chloride in the sweat over 60 millimoles per liter. The indeterminate range is 30 to 59. And then we think it's less likely for someone to have CF if their sweat chloride is less than 29. And even though we have genetics at this point, the gold standard for diagnosing CF is still the sweat test. It was in the 1950s that people started developing comprehensive care centers for CF, first in Cleveland by Dr. Leroy Matthews and subsequently in Boston by Dr. Harry Schwachman. And then in 1955, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation was founded by parents and physicians who really wanted to figure out a way to make the people who were dying from CF not only live longer, but feel better. And then many years later in 1989 was when the Cystic Fibrosis Transmembrane Conductance Regulator or CFTR gene was discovered. And from that discovery, we learned a lot about why CF happens. So let's talk about that now. So the CFTR gene tells the cell to make a protein of the same name, the CFTR protein. And we know that that protein is a chloride channel that sits at the top of the cell and through it chloride flows. There's also influence on other channels such as a sodium channel. But one thing it's I think a little bit hard to picture is how you get from a mutation that causes problems with a chloride channel to the lung disease that we see in CF as well as the other manifestations. The CF Foundation has created this video that I think really helps us understand why that happens. So I'll play that for you now. In this video, we're looking down the airway as if we were doing a bronchoscopy, so taking a camera down through the airway. And what we'll do is stop at the cell surface of the airway. And at the cell surface, we see there's a very thin layer of mucus and a very thin periciliary liquid layer through which the cilia can beat back and forth, back and forth. So if you inhale something that you're not supposed to, it can move up and you can cough it out. And the reason that works is because chloride is moving through the CFTR protein and then water can follow it. So you can regulate how much fluid is at this periciliary liquid layer and how thin or thick the mucus is. Now that's what happens under normal circumstances. Of course, in CF, that chloride channel is not working. So there's no way for water to follow it. And therefore you can't regulate that periciliary liquid layer and the mucus layer. And so over time, you see that that layer gets very thick. Mucus layer is thick, you lose the periciliary liquid layer. And then that acts as a nidus for infection. And your body's natural defense to infection is to try to fight it off with inflammation. But ultimately in CF, it causes more damage than it does actually kill the bacteria that are there. At this point, we know there are over 2000 mutations in the CF gene and work is being done by Dr. Gary Cutting in his lab at Johns Hopkins to determine what each one of those mutations actually does. The most common mutation by far is F508 del. And the other mutations are much more rare. So only five other mutations occur at a frequency of more than 1%. And on the right, I'm showing you the prevalence of the most common 25 mutations. I've highlighted for you in red, the mutations that are more common in people that are African-American and those in blue are more common in those of Hispanic descent. One of the things that researchers have done is try again to determine what those mutations actually do. And so this is one way of classifying how the different mutations cause the problems that cause CF. So under normal circumstances, the protein is made and then it's moved up to the top of the cell where it functions as a chloride channel. In class one through three mutations, there's a problem with the protein, either it's not made at all or it's misfolded and the cell discards it, or it gets to the top of the cell, but it doesn't actually function as a chloride channel. And in those, we call those minimal function mutations because there's almost no chloride transport whatsoever. 
in class four and class five mutations, either it gets there and it's sort of faulty and it lets some chloride through, or it gets there and there's not enough of it, or it gets discarded pretty quickly. So there is some chloride transport. We call those residual function mutations. So minimal function mutations where there's no chloride transport and residual function mutations where there's a little bit of chloride transport. So just to sum up the very first part of this, the pathophysiology of CF, it starts with a genetic and protein defect that causes abnormal sodium chloride bicarbonate and water transport. You get persistent airway infection. Your body tries to fight off that infection with inflammation, but ultimately that inflammation damages the airways. So you get into this vicious cycle of infection and inflammation and airway damage, and ultimately your airways get destroyed by that damage. So who does CF affect? Most of us were taught earlier in our careers that cystic fibrosis is the most, most common lethal genetic disorders in Caucasians. And that is absolutely true, but it also occurs in people of other races, which is critically important because that's a point that's often missed and people are then therefore misdiagnosed or diagnosed very late in their lives. At this point, there are about 30,000 people here in the US that we're aware of with CF and probably about 80,000 worldwide. Although I suspect that number will increase as people increasingly recognize that CF occurs in people of all races, as you can see from this globe. Now here in the US, we're fortunate that the CF Foundation actually keeps track of all of the people who give consent in the CF patient registry. So every time someone comes to clinic, or they go to the hospital, we keep track of that information. And this is the racial demographics of the people with CF in the US patient registry. So about 31,000 people. And you can see that again, most people with CF in the registry are white, but it does for sure occur in people of other races, including in people who are African-American and people who are Hispanic. So what kind of signs and symptoms do we see in people with cystic fibrosis? One of the very common manifestations is in the sinuses. So people have nasal polyps, which is shown in this picture and indicated in green on the CT scan. People also have chronic sinusitis. So infection and inflammation in their sinuses, again, in red shown here on the CT scan. People also have infection in their airways. So this is another graph from the CF patient registry. On the y-axis is the number of individuals, the percent, and on the x-axis, the individuals are grouped into different age buckets. And then the different colors represent the different types of infections that people have. So you can see that the most common infection that starts very early in kids is Staph aureus. And then later in life, people often have Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So staph and Pseudomonas are the most common bacteria, but there are some other bacteria as you can see in these other colors that occur in the airway of people with CF. And they're chronically there unless we're able to eradicate them very early. So what are the common symptoms and signs that we see for the lungs? People often will have a cough. They'll produce sputum sometimes with blood in it. They can sometimes have chest pain, sometimes airway reactivity or wheezing. They get airflow obstruction and then hypoxia or low levels of oxygen when their disease is very severe. And what about the common gastrointestinal manifestations or signs? So people have malabsorption because they do not produce the pancreatic enzymes that you need to absorb food and vitamins. And so because they're not absorbing vitamins, they often will have fat soluble vitamin deficiencies, So vitamin A, D, E, and K. People can also have chronic constipation and something called distal intestinal obstruction syndrome or DOS, which is basically an obstruction because of really severe levels of constipation. So what are some of the other com common manifestations? So people can have glucose intolerance and cystic fibrosis related diabetes because of destruction of the other part of the pancreas. People can have arthropathy, so joint pains and sometimes swelling. People can have osteopenia and osteoporosis. 
because they're not absorbing vitamin D well, they're not absorbing calcium and this damages the bones. We also know from relatively recent work done by Dr. Alexander Quitner, that not surprisingly, people with CF have more levels of depression and anxiety likely due to their chronic disease. And then finally, we know that there is impaired fertility in people with cystic fibrosis. So in men, they're actually born with something called congenital bilateral absence of the vas deferens. And those are the tubes you need to get sperm out. So men are born without those and about 97 to 98% of men with CF are born without their vas deferens and are therefore infertile. Women have thick cervical mucus because there are CFTR channels in the cervix. So there's about a 33% subfertility rate, meaning it's harder for women to get CF, or sorry, women to get pregnant with CF, but many women with CF can actually get pregnant fairly easily. So how do we make the diagnosis of cystic fibrosis? So in the US, since 2010, every state has newborn screening. Now, unfortunately, the newborn screening isn't done in a standard way, so it varies state to state. And because of that variability, there are some states where it's more likely that you'll miss the diagnosis, particularly in people who are Black, Indigenous, and other people of color. And that's something that I think Michelle and Terry are working very hard to remedy. You also use the sweat test, as I men mentioned earlier. So once a baby has a positive newborn screen or someone suspects that someone has CF, we do the gold standard sweat testing to see how high the chloride level is in their sweat. There's also a research tool that we sometimes use clinically called nasal potential difference, where we put a catheter in the nose and measure the chloride transport in the nose. And you can also do that in the gut and that's called intestinal current measurement. That's usually taken from a biopsy. And then finally, as I mentioned earlier, we can diagnose people because of their mutations. So analysis for the 70 common alleles identifies about 90% of the CF population. But again, it's really important to recognize that people of color have more rare mutations. So if you do only 70 common allele measurement, then you're likely going to misdiagnose somebody of color and tell them they don't have CF when they actually do. And that's part of the reason I think we have a lot of adult diagnosed CF still, particularly in people of color. So oftentimes people of color will present to physicians because they have sinus and pulmonary symptoms, but they may have better baseline lung function and not quite as low as you might've had if you had had a severe form of the disease that was diagnosed in childhood. Also, the gastrointestinal involvement is more varied. So almost all of the kids that are diagnosed or were diagnosed before newborn screening presented because they were having growth failure and steatorrhea, as I mentioned earlier. But now with newborn screening, we see that a little less often. And people who are diagnosed late often have pancreatic function, so they don't have problems with weight gain and steatorrhea. And sometimes, in fact, they have recurrent pancreatitis. And then finally, as I pointed out, they often have less common mutations. And sometimes because of that, they have those mutations where there's residual function that I mentioned earlier, some chloride transport, and therefore their sweat test falls into that indeterminate range. And not every physician understands that that indeterminate range oftentimes still means that someone has cystic fibrosis when they have the signs and symptoms and that abnormal sweat test. So it's really important to consider what we mean and what race actually means, particularly here in the US. So race is really a social and political construct rather than being a biological determination. And even ancestry is socially constructed in that people live together or in the same region oftentimes because of where they were born. So CFTR gene variants for sure, as shown in this map, 
occur differently in different regions, but they cannot be reliably predicted by someone's socially constructed race. And so therefore, again, especially for people of color, it's important to do a full mutation panel if you're trying to diagnose somebody with cystic fibrosis. And if you're someone who is suspected to have CF, you should really push your doctors to get that full mutation panel. So how do we treat people once we make the diagnosis of cystic fibrosis? Really, there are these pillars that have been there for many, many years. That's repleting and maintaining adequate nutrition. So people have to replace the pancreatic enzymes their body isn't taking and also supplement the vitamin levels that their body isn't absorbing. You have to promote mucus clearance. So you can do that by thinning the mucus with medications like hypertonic saline and Dornase Alpha and also by mechanical means, such as the vest shown in this picture where you shake the body and try to loosen up the mucus so that people can cough it out. And then you need to control respiratory tract infection. So I mentioned that people have chronic infection in their airways, and we try to suppress that level of infection with inhaled antibiotics. Of course, sometimes people get sick in spite of all that, and you have to give them IV or oral antibiotics to really try to suppress that infection and treat it. Fortunately, the CF Foundation has commissioned multiple groups to make guidelines. So we actually have guidelines for how to diagnose people and how to treat people during their chronic, relatively healthy phase, as well as when they get sick. And all of those can be found on the CF Foundation website, cff.org. So which, with all of these treatments, we've actually made great strides in the survival and the quality of life for people with cystic fibrosis. So this is another graph from the CF Foundation used from data in the CF Foundation registry. On the y-axis is projected age of survival. So this is a mathematical equation that looks at the change in lung function in the whole group over time. And then on the x-axis is the year. So it's in 10-year buckets from 1930 to 2010. And so hopefully next year we'll have the 2010 data in there or 2020 data in there as well. But if you look back in the 1930s, when Dr. Dorothy Anderson described the pathological description, the survival was very, very poor, as I mentioned earlier. So less than five years of age. As the care centers were developed and specific therapies to treat the signs and symptoms of CF were developed, you can see that survival continued to increase. So that what was once a childhood disease has now become a disease where more than half the people who have it are adults. And in fact, the median predicted survival for people with cystic fibrosis as of the 2019 data showed an average of around 46 years. So a tremendous increase in the survival of people with cystic fibrosis. But again, the pandemic has highlighted the systemic issues that lead to health inequality in people across the United States. And this is also true in cystic fibrosis. So Dr. McGarry um, shared this slide with me, which I appreciate. And she's looked at some of this data and shown that for BIPOC, people of color, Black, Indigenous, and people of color, survival is worse, as is lung function. So in this graph, we're looking at the non-Hispanic white lung function which was 85.7% at the time she did this study, and then compared that to the Hispanic lung function, which was 80, so 5.7% lower. Then she also looked at the FV1 in black patients, and you can see that it was 3.9% lower. And why is that important? Because we know in cystic fibrosis that lung function correlates with survival. And you can see that here. So in this study by O'Connor, they show that Hispanic patients have an 85% increased risk of death and black patients have a 48% increased risk of death compared to non-Hispanic white patients. Hispanics mean age at death was 5.7 years earlier than that of non-Hispanic whites in the study by Rowe. And then Dr. Bu showed that in California, only 75% of Hispanic patients survived 18 years after diagnosis compared to over 90% of survival in non-Hispanic white patients. So those 
differences because of health inequalities are definitely manifest in the CF world as well. And what about the impact of COVID? We know that COVID has very differentially affected communities of color. And this is also true in CF. So overall, fortunately, people with CF have done relatively well when they've contracted COVID. So you can see that there are a total of 1,200 cases of people with CF who have contracted COVID. And this is based on the US patient registry. Of those, about 195 or 16% of those 1,200 cases have required hospitalization. But you can see that there have been 10 deaths, unfortunately, and of those deaths, two were African Americans, so a 20% death rate, which again is higher than the death rate for the whole population. So we still need to address these health inequalities. So what about the research? There's been a lot of research in CF, especially since the gene was discovered. So I told you before that there are CF care centers. But the CF Foundation also funds CF research centers at some of those same sites because they determined that it was unlikely that big pharmaceutical companies would want to work in the rare disease space. And so they therefore created their own research network so we can conduct these studies in a, the most efficient way possible to get therapies to people with cystic fibrosis. So while the United States has really been focusing on modulating CFTR, so the UK has actually looked a lot at gene therapy, which hasn't quite panned out yet, but we here in the United States have focused on modulating CFTR. And what do we mean by that? So for a potentiator, it's a small molecule in a pill taken by mouth that actually improves the flow of chloride in channels that are already at the cell surface. So for example, in G551D, there is a channel at the cell surface, but it won't open. And so when you give the potentiator, it opens and then chloride can be transported. In the case of a corrector, for the most common mutation like F508 del, we know that that protein is misfolded and so it doesn't usually make it to the top of the cell to function as a chloride channel. So you need to add a corrector to help move it up to the top of the cell and then you can get some chloride transport. What we saw in the very early studies was that it wasn't enough just to correct F508 del. You not only needed to get it up to the top of the cell, but you also needed to give something to make it work better once there. So that's where combination therapy came from. So get the protein to the top of the cell when it's not already there and then potentiate it, make it work better so that chloride can be transported. The very first drug that was approved was called Ivacaptor or Kalydeco. And in phase three trials, so large trials over six months time or 48 weeks, they show that you could actually improve lung function as well as body mass, so nutrition and quality of life with Ivacaptor or Kalydeco. So in the graphs that I'm showing you, on the y-axis is lung function in kids that are older and adults and kids that are younger. And you can see that very rapidly, so within the first two weeks of taking Ivacaptor, people's lung function improved. And that was sustained over the first six weeks and when they were allowed to continue on the therapy out through 144 weeks. And then those who were in the placebo group not surprisingly had a little bit of decline in their lung function, but once they started on open label, so actual drug, it rapidly improved and that was sustained over the course of the rest of the trial. So a home run with an improvement of around 10.6% in people's lung function, again, improvement in their nutrition and improvement in their quality of life. So initially, Kaleidico was approved in 2012 and then in 2015, a combination therapy, Lumicaptor, Ivacaptor, or Cambi, was approved for two copies of F508 Dell. So those with two copies had or Cambi. And then in 2018, Tezacaptor, Ivacaptor, or Simnico was approved for people who have two copies of F508 Dell or one copy and one of those residual function mutations that I talked to you about. So in 2018, we had a modestly effective modulator or Cambi or Simdico that only improved lung function around two to 4% instead of that 10.6% that 
we saw with Ivacaptor. And then there were 14% who were able to take Ivacaptor, so had a really good modulator, and then 39% who still had no modulator at all. So we still had work to do, and we did this with a triple combination therapy. And this data was published in 2019 when this drug was approved. So the triple combination therapy is Alexacaptor, a corrector, plus Tezacaptor, another corrector, and Ivacaptor, the potentiator. And what we showed in those phase three trials, both in people with one copy of f 508 del and a minimal function mutation, one that doesn't really have any chloride transport, or two copies of f 508 del there were great improvements in people's health. So the first graph is showing you the lung function improvement, Again, on the y-axis here is lung function, and you can see there was this very rapid and robust improvement, about 14% in people's lung function when they got drug compared to placebo. There was also a huge improvement in their sweat chloride. So again, here's the placebo group. On the y-axis is the measurement of sweat chloride. And then on the x-axis is the time in the study. There was that rapid improvement in sweat chloride. So some people falling into that indeterminate range and that was sustained over the course of the study. So improvements in lung function and improvements in their CFTR function or sweat chloride. And really importantly, there was a decrease in pulmonary exacerbation. So this is showing the time to someone's first pulmonary exacerbation when they were on drug or placebo. So purple is the drug, Alexacaptor, Tezacaptor, Ivacaptor, or Trikafta and then there's placebo. And you can see that people who were on placebo had exacerbations sooner. So there was about a 70% reduction in pulmonary exacerbations when people were on drug. And that's critical because we know that about 25% of people when they have a pulmonary exacerbation will never get their lung function back to the baseline. And that means that every single time someone has a pulmonary exacerbation, they're at risk for permanent lung function loss. So this drug helped prevent that. So those are studies, but what about the real world? This is a graph from the CF Foundation as well, and you can see the number of exacerbations on the y-axis and what happened when Trikafta was approved. There was this marked decrease in pulmonary exacerbations that was sustained even through the COVID pandemic. But this brings me to another point, and that is that people of color are often not asked or included in clinical research. And that's really important because we want to make sure that these therapies work for everybody. So this, again, is data from Dr. McGarry, and you can see the percent of clinical trials, and not very many of them even reported race of the participants. And then if you look how many people participated, again, almost everybody who participated in most of these trials was white. There was very little participation of people who were Hispanic, Black, or Asian. And that's something we need to fix. So I told you in 2018, we had modulators that worked really well for a small proportion. We had ones that worked moderately well for another proportion, and then some that didn't have anybody or any modulator at all. And then now in 2021, we have modulators for 90% of the CF population that work really, really well. But once again, we have to think about race when it comes to CFTR modulators. So this group in this first table that I'm showing you looked at how many people have a copy of F508 Dell. And you can see that when people talk about that last 10%, it's because in the white population, 10% of people don't have a copy of f 508 del But if you look at the Hispanic, Black, and Asian population and the Native American population, that number of people without a copy of f 508 del is higher than 10%, much higher. And recently, Dr. McCauley looked at the registry and said how many people or what percentage are eligible for a modulator. And again, in the Caucasian population, it's 92%, but it's only 70 6% in the Hispanic population and only 70% in the Black population. So people who are already disadvantaged because they're diagnosed late, they have unequal access to health care, there are systemic bias that prevents them from getting good health care, are also less likely to qualify for modulators. So where do we go from here? 
Fortunately, there is still a great deal of research that's happening. For those of you who haven't seen it before, this is the drug development pipeline. And these different areas represent whether it's still in early trials, if it's in phase one trials, phase two trials where it's being tested in the group of people who need the drug, and then phase three trials, which are the ones that help get it to patients. And so there are still a number of drugs in the pipeline, both to directly restore CFTR function, including in those people with rare mutations. There are also studies looking at helping those with stop mutations or nonsense mutations who fall into that 10%. And of course, we're still looking for drugs that treat the signs and symptoms of cystic fibrosis. So back in the days when we were just about to get Kaleidico, President Obama talked about what he saw in the CF community. And that was, I want the country that eliminated polio and mapped the human genome to lead a new era of medicine, one that delivers the right treatment at the right time. In some patients with cystic fibrosis, this approach has reversed a disease once thought unstoppable. And that was back when we were just getting Kaleidico. So we're getting much closer to that dream now, but we still have work to do. So in summary, the quantity and quality of life has improved for people with CF. Although CF is more common in people of Caucasian descent, it can occur in someone of any race. And we need to make sure that we're not only diagnosing it early, but we're treating people earlier and we're including them in clinical trials. Treating the basic defect has become an option for about 90% of the population of people with cystic fibrosis, but differentially in communities of color. So therefore we need to continue to do research to find therapies to treat the signs and symptoms of CF, but also the basic defect for everyone with cystic fibrosis. So with that, I will say thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much to Michelle and Terry for all that you're doing, for, to Beth for um, also inviting me here today. And with that, I will stop and take questions. I think I already have some here in the chat. So the first one says, can you address the fear people have of getting the COVID vaccine because they think that it was rushed out? That's actually a great question. And so I showed you that people of color definitely are getting COVID more often and they're dying from COVID more often. And so it's really critically important that we get people vaccinated as quickly as possible. So people are somewhat in fear of it, I think, because it seemed like it was rushed, but Honestly, the mRNA technology has been there for a very long time. It was waiting to be used in a situation like this where we could rapidly apply it to create a new vaccine for a new outbreak, and that was done. The other thing is, is that the trials still happen the way they were supposed to. So oftentimes we'll do the phase one trial and then the phase two trial and then the phase three trial. And because we needed to get vaccine to people to stop this pandemic, they did them at the same time, but there were still thousands and thousands of people in the studies. So even though people feel like it was rushed, it really was done in a way that it was just a compressed amount of time. So the safety data is still there for those. And I already got my vaccine. I'm very fortunate because I'm in medicine. I was able to get it early and I did great with it. And I'm very relieved to know that because these vaccines are so effective, 95% chance that I will not get severe disease. So I urge people to definitely get your vaccine as soon as you come onto line in your state. Okay, there's also a question that says, when newborn screening is done, are common mutations seen in the African-American population included in the panel? So again, in everybody, the most common mutation is f 508 del And so definitely, African-Americans often will have F508 DEL, but some of the other mutations that African-Americans often have are not included in those common panels. And that's why it's so important that if somebody has the signs and symptoms of cystic fibrosis, that you actually do the full panel if you missed it on that very small screening panel, because you're often gonna miss the other mutations that are much more rare, but more common in people of color. So one of the other questions is, what is being done to get more people of color involved in research? That's a great question. So the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation has actually become much more aware of this issue, partly because of the work that's done by people like Dr. McGarry and Dr. McCauley. 
and also because there are those of us who are trying to speak up and say, hey, this is really, really an important issue. So they have recently been reaching out to people in communities of color to ask their opinion, to ask why they haven't participated and if they've been asked and trying to be much more inclusive. And I left the, on the screen the community voice. So that's an opportunity for people to go in and give their opinion about some of the research that's being done. And we're trying to make sure that everybody's voice is heard through community voice. So I would again urge people to go in and sign up for community voice and you only have to speak up when you want to, but it gives you the opportunity to use your voice to help dictate what research is being done. Next question is what more can be done to bring more awareness in the black community of the possibility a person has cystic fibrosis. Well, I think part of it is things like this conference and I'm so grateful to Terry and Michelle for putting this together because I think that again in the past it was taught to people that this was a disease that only happened to white people and so that has to be reversed and conferences like this will help spread that message also i'm trying to speak at lots and lots of conferences and bring up the fact that it occurs in people of any race so anybody who is speaking to different communities needs to make sure that they are emphasizing that point when they're speaking to physicians, when they're speaking to social workers, when they're speaking to respiratory therapists. So everybody needs to be aware that CF does occur in people of color. Oftentimes the sweat tests may be indeterminate range. And so you have to take that into consideration. Oftentimes if you do a limited mutation panel, you're gonna miss that diagnosis. So it has to be a full mutation panel and as I mentioned, Terry and Michelle are really working on trying to make sure that newborn screening is done in an appropriate way so that people of color are not diagnosed late, which is known to be associated with worse outcomes. So we need to make sure that newborn screening is done appropriately in every single state. Okay, the next question is, should people be concerned with the increase in COVID variants? You know, that's a really great question and we're trying to make sure that we keep track of what's happening. Thus far, it seems that the vaccines are actually still working really well against the other variants, but that doesn't mean that we need to stop wearing masks or stop social distancing. We still need to do those things to prevent outbreaks, especially if you're not vaccinated. But even if you are vaccinated, it's not quite clear yet whether or not you can still asymptomatically spread the disease. So you still need to wear your mask, you still need to social distance, and you still need to wash your hands. But right now, thus far, the approved vaccines are working against the COVID variant. So again, I urge everybody to get it as soon as you possibly can. So it looks like I have about nine seconds left. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Michelle. Again, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much for that excellent and most informative talk. Dr. Taylor, uh, uh, Taylor Carlson, we just appreciate everything that you are doing, not only for cystic fibrosis in general, but for African Americans like Terry with cystic fibrosis uh, in particular. So we really, really appreciate your participation in this historical event. And now it is my great honor to introduce another Dr. Taylor, Dr. Jason K. Taylor, who is nationally renowned and respected as a rheumatologist and internist. He is a native Mississippian and currently practices as a staff rheumatologist at St. Dominic's Hospital which is located in Madison, Mississippi. Dr. Teller began his career in academics, serving as an assistant professor of medicine, division of rheumatology at the University of Mississippi Medical Center, and as a staff rheumatologist at the GV Sunny Montgomery VA Medical Center. He has guest lectured at several local, regional, and national health uh, oriented symposiums, meetings, health affairs, and awareness events, and has previously served nationally on the American College of Rheumatology 2020 Task Force Committee, as well as the Association of Rheumatology Health Professionals, e-learning, 
Society Committee. He has been pivotal in reviving the states of Mississippi's Rheumatology Society, and that also stands for MSARS, and and serving as the president since 2016, where he has worked on promoting initiatives pertinent to the professional rheumatology medical community. Currently, as I mentioned earlier, he is in private practice at St. Dominic's Hospital in Central Mississippi, where he provides diverse care for diseases, which include uh, rare uh, uh, rheumatology diseases with special emphasis in rheumatoid arthritis, uh, osteoarthritis, and of course, lupus, which is today's featured topic. But Dr. Teller is so much more. He has been one of my most endeared friends for the last 15 years in county, and he has truly been a godsend to both Terry yes. and myself. So without further Ado, it is indeed my honor, our honor, <laughs> to present you to the esteemed Dr. Jason K. Taylor. Thank you, Michelle. I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Um, and uh, I thank you very much for our friendship. I've known Michelle for many years now, uh, going back to uh, my early days when I was. Uh, on faculty at the University of Mississippi Medical Center uh, doing research and teaching in the academic arena. Uh, I'm now in private practice, been in private practice for about the last eight, nine years. Uh, so out of that arena of research and doing a lot of presentations, but I really do appreciate the opportunity to speak at this your inaugural uh, conference. Um, and I think at this point, I'll go ahead and proceed. Uh, I'll my slides will be pulled up here. Um, <clears throat> so I will start uh, my presentation at this point. Um, so I was asked to talk about lupus today. And um, and uh, and as you know, Michelle has lupus. And when I first met Michelle, I didn't, did not know you had that diagnosis. Um, this is a very complex disease. Um, and I'm here to talk for about 30 minutes, so I'll do my best. What I want to do here was just give the audience, uh, the attendees, a little bit of uh, information about lupus. Uh, I understand that most of the attendees are gonna be non-medical, and so I tailored my talk uh, towards that. Just wanted to give a good, kind of a basic understanding of lupus. So what I want to do in this talk was to talk about Objectives here to, to again give some information about lupus, uh, beginning with uh, talking a little bit about epidemiology and causes, uh, manifestations, and then also management. I typically like to start off uh, just by letting uh, the audience know that uh, indeed, uh, one of the things about lupus, there's a lot of stigma with lupus and uh, people uh, feel that stigma because they sometimes don't realize that, that they are usually, they are not alone, uh, that this disease is uh, more common than they think, and it affects all walks of, people of all walks of life, including celebrities. And so um, there are several families, people in the, uh, in the world who have lupus. Uh, the singer, singer Selena Gomez is one, uh, she's had lupus and has often had to miss concerts due to flares of her lupus. Next slide. Tony Braxton is another famous celebrity with lupus. Uh, she's had lupus since about 2001, and she's often described her lupus uh, when it flares, it's like having the flu. Nick Cannon, another celebrity, entrepreneur, actor, entertainer, comedian, who's had lupus since about 2011. His lupus actually presented in a severe fashion uh, with kidney involvement and blood clots. Seal, a uh, well-known uh, musician and singer with lupus, and he has a form of lupus called discord lupus. And for those who are in the rap world, uh, Trick Daddy, also known as Maurice 
Samuel Young is uh, also have lupus and he has discord lupus. Paula Adu, uh, she's a well-known entertainer. She's often involved with uh, promoting lupus initiatives on social media and also can be seen at a lot of red carpet events uh, promoting lupus. So uh, again, I created these slides uh, with the background of that this will be more of a non-medical, non-physician audience. But what I wanted to do is just kind of, again, uh, let everyone know what, what lupus is. So what is lupus? Uh, also called lupus, systemic lupus erythematosus, SLE, or just lupus, is a chronic disease that can affect various parts of the body. And it is what is called an autoimmune condition, meaning that your body's immune system is attacking itself. Normally, the immune system attacks for, foreign uh, pathogens. In this case, the immune system is attacking your own tissues. It can involve pain, swelling, and damage that can occur in many organs, including vital organs such as the kidneys. Okay, next slide. So in terms of the epidemiology, what looks at uh, uh, the, it's kind of the study of uh, the prevalence of this condition in the U.S. is about 20 to 150 cases per 100,000. We see that it's more common in urban than rural areas and has a much more higher prevalence among Asians, African-Americans, African-Caribbeans, Hispanic-Americans compared to Caucasians. This is, a, this is a condition that is predominantly affects women. It's a predominantly disease of women with a female to male ratio of eight to one. In particular, it affects women in the reproductive years. 65% of patients will have disease onset between the ages of 16 and 55. Factors affecting this disease. We know that it's a much more severe disease in African Americans. In particular, African Americans and Hispanics can have a poor prognosis with renal involvement. Clinical status is poor in those with less education, low socioeconomic status, and with inadequate access to medical care. The exact etiology of lupus remains unknown, but it's obviously multifactorial. A variety of uh, factors are thought to be involved with uh, the uh, development of lupus, including genetic, environmental, hormonal, and immunological factors. And we'll talk a little bit about each of these as, on the, over the next few slides. Genetic factors, like with most diseases, there's a genetic basis. And we see a high concordance rate of lupus and monozygotic or identical twins. And these are identical twins are, are created by one sperm fertilizing one egg which splits into two and have, they have uh, similar genes in the same sex. We see it as 29 fold higher among siblings in the general population. And in one population based study in Taiwan, Taiwan they found that the first three, first three relatives have a 17-fold increased risk of lupus compared to the general population. We know that hormonal factors can play a role. In particular, estrogen is thought to play a role in lupus. Testosterone and progesterone actually have mitigating roles in lupus. Pituitary hormones, including prolactin, has been shown to be high in individuals who have flares of lupus. We know that lupus patients often have thyroid disease. The primary immunological abnormality in lupus is the ANA or anti-nuclear antibody. And this is the, the key immunological disturbance seen in lupus. You must have a positive ANA in order to have the diagnosis for lupus. And all individuals with lupus will have that, that ANA at some point in their course. Environmental factors can include viruses. Uh, it is thought that potentially a virus may be the trigger to, for the development of lupus. Viruses by a process called molecular mimicry is thought to be one factor that may cause the development of lupus. Where an individual is exposed to a virus and exposed to those antigens, those same antigens may resemble self antigens or self proteins on tissues within the body and triggering an immune response. UV light, which is a portion of sunlight, 
has been shown to trigger uh, skin manifestations in lupus by causing inflammation and damage to the tissue. Other factors may include silica dust, soil, pottery material, cement, and cigarette smoking, which may increase the risk of developing lupus, especially in African-American women. We also know that certain medications have been associated with lupus, including antibiotics, and in particular, the sulfur antibiotics are, have been seen more frequently as having allergic reactions in people with lupus. Symptoms of lupus can vary tremendously. There's a lot of her tremendous amount of heterogeneity in terms of lupus symptoms. And lupus is often called the great mimicker because it can mimic so many other conditions and diseases. Most uh, lupus patients will have fatigue. By far and large, this is by far the most common symptom in lupus is fatigue. Fever can be seen, especially during episodes of flares. Muscle pain and sometimes muscle weakness may also be seen in flares. Weight changes can occur due to a variety of reasons. Flares, steroid use can cause weight gain. And also if there's kidney involvement, salt and water retention may lead to weight gain. Specific organ symptoms include, also include joint pain and stiffness or arthritis and a variety of skin changes. And we'll go through some of the more classic skin rashes in lupus over the next few slides. This is the malar or butterfly rash that is seen in lupus. And this is the rash that most people that are not in the medical field or may be aware of, aware of. And this is the butterfly rash or the cheeks that spares the nasolabial folds and it tends to have a red appearance and also sometimes some subtle swelling or edema. Another, another depiction of the male or rash. And this one's a little bit more prominent, more red, um, and more erythematous. This is uh, called a discord rash, which is another common rash seen in lupus. Um, it has a, more of a scaly appearance, uh, scarring scaly appearance uh, and on the cheek here in this patient. Here's a, uh, another example of the discord rash. Again, erythematous plaque, with some scaling and uh, changes in the pigmentation of the skin. Another feature in a number of the connective tissue diseases, including lupus, is a condition called Raynaud's. And uh, we see this uh, very commonly in lupus. And this is a condition where the digital arteries in the fingertips and the toes and the feet will spasm and you will have characteristic color changes, including, uh, as you see in A, a white color. Uh, and then sometimes the fingers can become more cyanotic and have a bluish or purplish color. Other issues are include photosensitivity, uh, which is a very common feature or symptom of lupus. Uh, individuals will with minimal exposure to the sun will uh, begin to have irritation of the skin and rashes. Um, and so it's very important for lupus patients to protect their skin using sunscreen with a sun protection factor of at least 50 or more, avoiding sun exposure in the middays between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. and also avoiding medications. There's certain medications that may make photosensitivity wor worse, including common antibiotics and sulfur-based antibiotics. Kidneys is a, a very important potential manifestation of lupus, one that can have uh, detrimental effects, uh, can be a very uh, important cause of causing end-stage mental disease um, and dialysis. And rheumatologists are very keen in checking your analysis on a regular basis, checking for potential signs and features of inflammation in the kidneys, in particular inflammation of the glomerulus, which is a part of the kidney, which is very important in filtering waste and excess fluids. And if this is damaged, it's a condition called glomerulonephritis can develop and patients can lose protein in the urine 
and subsequently began to develop swelling in places such as the legs. So we are very keen to check urinalysis, uh, to look and uh, examine for evidence of potential inflammation of the kidneys. The digestive system can be affected. Uh, common problems that we see in lupus can be pancreatitis, uh, peritonitis, uh, inflammation of the lining of the abdomen, colitis, uh, inflammation of the colon, um, and then also some of the drugs that are used to treat lupus can sometimes themselves cause problems, anti-inflammatories or NSAIDs, causing stomach ulcers and stomach issues, and also steroids. Uh, lung involvement can vary. Uh, a, a common problem that we see sometimes is plur pleurisy or pleuritis, and that's inflammation of the lining of the lung. Uh, there can be shortness of breath secondary to a variety of reasons, including pleural effusions, where there's fluid that uh, can de uh, develop and uh, around the, the lung, <clears throat> pneumonitis, uh, inflammation of the air sacs of the lung, interstitial lung disease can also be seen. In terms of the heart, uh, pericarditis, where there's inflammation of the pericardium, which is a tissue that surrounds the heart. Uh, a little bit less common, myocarditis, involvement of the heart muscle itself. And we also know that uh, autoimmune diseases and some of the rheumatic diseases, including lupus, uh, there's a high association with coronary artery disease. Nervous system can be affected. Um, issues including difficulty concentrating, thinking clearly, or also I call it memory fog, uh, confusion, memory loss. Patients can have issues with depression, anxiety, headaches, seizures, neuropathies, weakness, numbness, and stroke. And also uh, CNS lupus can involve a uh, potentially more mortal condition called cerebritis, and this is inflammation uh, of the brain. When the eyes are affected, typically the most common issue is going to be dry eyes, which can be treated with artificial tears in most cases. So as you can see, there are a variety of potential symptoms with lupus. Uh, these symptoms can also mimic symptoms in other conditions. And so different <laughs> over the years, uh, societies such as the American College of Rheumatology and the ULAR, which is the European League of against rheumatism have tried to create classif classification criteria to help identify lupus, especially early onset lupus, uh, not necessarily always for diagnosis, but also for inclusion in research studies. And this is one example, this is from 2019, the classification criteria. Uh, this table, this flow chart shows that initially you must have an ANA, that's the first criteria, an ANA positive, or a title of at least one to 80. And then uh, uh, looking at different symptoms and different uh, domains will get you certain points. And a score of 10 with the positive ANA uh, has a high sensitivity and specificity for lupus. In terms of treatment, um, treatment varies, uh, conservative, methods uh, in terms of lifestyle changes and preventive interventions. First of all, sun protection is key, as we talked about earlier, wearing sunscreen, uh, wearing clothing, protective clothing, and, and uh, limiting your sun exposure. Diet and nutrition is important. There's no specific diet for lupus patients, but a healthy diet is definitely key. Um, and watching out for uh, potential side effects of medicines, including steroids, which in all, often can lead to increased appetite and weight, weight gain, uh, hypertension and nephritis, and watching your salt intake. Vitamins are rarely needed uh, unless uh, you know, there's, there's a true deficiency, but if you eat a balanced diet, you typically you do not become deficient in your vitamins. Exercise is important for the muscles and strength and then avoiding smoker, smoking, which is a risk factor for lupus and lupus flares. There are a variety of medicines to treat lupus. Uh, very common medicines that are used uh, are NSAIDs, uh, hydroxychloroquine, also called Plaquenil, which became popular here in the 
early days of COVID as it was thought to possibly be a treatment for uh, coronavirus. And rheumatologists, uh, there was a shortage for a while in terms of attaining Plaquenil. That's gotten better now. But most lupus patients, virtually all, will have Plaquenil on board. It's a uh, vital medicine as an immunological effects, can treat skin, can treat the joints, uh, and some of the minor constitutional symptoms uh, that lupus can cause. Steroids are very important, especially during treatment of flares. We find that lupus tends to be a disease of activity and inactivity. And when it's active, our primary uh, drug of choice to control disease will be steroids. There are a number of immunosuppressants used to treat lupus, uh, especially lupus that is moderate to severe manifestations, drugs such as methotrexate, uh, which can be used with severe arthritis, uh, medicines such as mycophenolate, often used to treat lupus nephritis, um, as the athothioprine or imiran, again, more severe lupus, cyclosporin, used to treat lupus nephritis as a new agent on the market now. Vocalsporin has come out within the last few months. Cyclophosphamide, severe lupus, lupus nephritis. Rituximab, which is somewhat controversial, but is often used in refractory lupus. Belimumab, also called Benlista, used to treat active lupus and active nephritis. Pregnancy is a subject that comes up quite often. And um, in terms of uh, advice with pregnancy, majority of women who can, with lupus, can you know, very easily, without any issues, uh, become pregnant and carry the term. However, it is caution that if the disease is active, to not become pregnant. There's a higher risk of miscarriage and exacerbation of the lupus during pregnancy. And the typical recommendation is to avoid pregnancy for at least six months uh, until the disease is quiet for at least six months. Next slide. Prognosis. This is a disease that has autoheterogeneity. As I said before, it can have very mild disease. Some patients will have little to no activity. And then there's those that would have a lot of severe disease. And so it's, there's a lot of uh, heterogeneity in it. Uh, but for the most part, we found that over the years, uh, early diagnosis and with newer therapies that are being developed, uh, patients are living longer lives. Poor prognostic factors include renal disease, hypertension, male sex, young age, older age of presentation, and lower socioeconomic status, status African-American race, presence of antiphospholipid antibodies. Uh, these are antibodies that are uh, against certain components of the cell membrane, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, which is having the antiphospholipid antibodies and clotting uh, and then high overall disease activity. The five-year survival rate in lupus has dramatically increased since the mid 20th century from approximately 40% in the 1950s to greater than 90% since the 1980s. There are several online uh, sources to get more information on lupus. I listed a few here. My favorite would be, of course, the American College of Rheumatology, Arthritis Foundation, the Lupus Foundation of America, et cetera. I think at this point, uh, I've been asked to look at some of the questions. I think the first question I have is, does stress make sim lupus symptoms worse? Um, yes. Uh, I would answer that simply. I would say yes. Uh, I've seen this in my patients um, that, you know, definitely stress can play a role, mind and body, um, uh, could possibly be a trigger for flares. Another question is, are people with lupus at a higher risk of bad outcome if the person gets COVID? If so, why? So <clears throat> this has been a, a, another very frequent question that we've uh, gotten in my practice, in my, in terms of my patients. Uh, we don't have any data to, to really suggest that uh, having an autoimmune disease at this point uh, gives you a better, worse outcome. Um, 
and the same question comes along with in terms of medicines. And recently, uh, February the 8th, our National Society of American College of Rheumatology uh, sent out a guidance statement. Uh, and there's just there's so much unknown here. Uh, there's just not enough data to say that the lupus will give you the potential to have a better, worse outcome. Next question, is lupus hard to diagnose in people of color? Uh, I would say no. Um, uh, I think uh, this is a disease that is more predominant and uh, had tends to be more severe in people of color. Um, if they present with the appropriate features, I think the diagnosis is not that difficult to make. Is there research being done to identify any genetic predispositions that may make someone more likely to develop lupus? Uh, yes, there is, there is research in that area. There are certain genetic mar markers, there are certain polymorphisms I didn't get into on this with this talk uh, that may make individuals more predisposed to developing lupus. Are there certain symptoms that precede stroke? Um, good question. I, I would say, um, I would say, in my experience, not always. Um, if it's stroke related to lupus, uh, for the most part, these are going to be folks that have severe disease, folks that have other lupus manifestations. But I can't say that there's any particular certain symptom uh, that may perceive that give you the clue that they may have a stroke in lupus. Okay. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat. If there are, please place them now. If not, I would turn it back over to Michelle. And I think I'm next in line will be Dr. Hester. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Taylor. I'll take over from here. This is Dr. Amy Hester. I didn't, I actually didn't have a question that made it into the chat, so I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here. Um, so use of steroids and weight gain is really a problem, and it causes a lot of noncompliance in individuals who really worry about that. How do you handle that in the patients that you take care of when that's a problem for them? It's difficult sometimes because patients don't always want to take steroids. Um, and it's, uh, it's a battle sometimes to uh, get them to realize the importance of taking steroids when it's necessary. And I try to tell my patients that I won't use the steroids unless I really felt the need to do it. And I felt that um, this will be important enough to control your disease. And so uh, we see it quite a bit. And uh, ultimately uh, you make the advice, you make the recommendation and you, you know, you look for your patient to follow, but it, you know, people don't want to use steroids for all the potential side effects that go along with it. Got it. Thank you for that answer. I appreciate that. And I appreciate your presentation and, and really um, taking it to the, to the general population. I think even as providers, when we um, are not, you know, really educated about uh, specific and rare diseases, it helps to start our knowledge base right there where you've done today. So it was, it was really helpful for me. So I appreciate that. You're welcome. Thank you. So we're, I'm going to transition gears just a little bit. So I'm Dr. Amy Hester. I'm a board member of NOSF and, and, and very thankful for that. Um, I haven't known Michelle and Terry for a very long time, just a couple of years. So um, uh, Michelle and I always tell each other when we count our blessings, we count each other twice. So um, I certainly uh, count those blessings for having the privilege of being on the NOSF board. And so um, We'll have our uh, panelists come on at this point. Um, I'm gonna introduce those and then I'm gonna field some questions to them. And then if you have any questions for them, please go ahead and uh, put those in the chat as well. And I'll, I'll monitor that as we move forward. Um, I'll start with introductions for uh, Terry Wright. He's 58 years old and president and co-founder of the National Organization of African-Americans with Cystic Fibrosis, NOSF. He was actually diagnosed unexpectedly with cystic fibrosis at the age of 54. Um, Terry is an author. He is also a master gardener and has many, many talents. Um, he didn't put that in his bio. I'm throwing that, uh, that extra in there. Um, and then his wife, um, Dr. Michelle Wright, she is co-founder and board chair of 
the National Association of African Americans with Cystic Fibrosis. She was diagnosed with lupus um, 27 years ago. So both of them um, dealing with rare dis diseases as a minority. And so that's part of what gives them their passion for um, developing and um, fostering NOSF and the missions that NOSF has. Um, Michelle is a, an author and an entrepreneur herself. And so i um, super excited to have both of them on our panel today. And then we're also joined by Everett Rice. He is a communication and community engagement specialist with the California State Senate, where he advises and develops messaging and marketing for state senators. He was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis at the age of nine and at 50 years old lives with cystic fibrosis and CF related diabetes. And uh, our provider on the panel today is, Dr. is uh, Zephora Seeley. She is a social worker with the Cystic Fibrosis Center at St. Christopher's Hospital for Children in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Prior to working at St. Christopher's, she worked at Yale New Haven Hospital in New Haven, Connecticut, and the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Her career and passion have been focused on working with underserved communities. And so um, all of our panelists have their videos on so you can see them. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to jump right in, Terry, I'm going to pick on you first a little bit, because I think, you know, as the co-founder of NOSF, and I think you've got a really powerful story. I know when Michelle first shared your diagnosis with me, I had to be fully transparent. I was really surprised um, as a nurse. I took care of many uh, CF patients um, throughout my years at the bedside and had never once took care of, of a minority person that had CF. And so. I literally had to go look it up and say, wow, I didn't know that was possible. And so for me as a provider, just being fully transparent about that, um, I don't know that it was an unconscious bias or just a lack of experience, but definitely an eye opener for me. And so, Terry, you you had an interesting journey. Um, you were diagnosed very late. And so I would start off with you by asking you to kind of tell us a little bit about that journey and what that was like for you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Uh, my journey. Let's say I'm uh, 58 years of age. I was just diagnosed in 2017, four years ago. And I was devastated about the whole deal. And throughout my journey, I had all the uh, signs of cystic fibrosis. Uh, growing up, pancreatitis, uh, very, very uh, uh, so steer, uh, uh, severe stomach problems. Um, uh, I would just get dehydrated a lot. Um, didn't have for, for whatever reason, I, I would participate in a sports run, just, just get dehydrated, big grains of salt would come on my body. And one particular time I got so dehydrated, I had went into kidney failure, uh, just didn't know all that was just kind of uh, related to that. Uh, chronic pneumonia, uh, sinusitis, uh, migraine headaches, uh, uh, among many other things. So I had the opportunity to see many doctors, just many doctors, and they would just constantly tell me, uh, these are the things that's wrong with me. And, they, and that would fix me uh, as I traveled to them. That would take care of all my problems and stuff. Come to find out, uh, it didn't take care of my problems. And on down the road, it would just reoccur, reoccur again, once again, just, just chronic, uh, different things that would go on with my body, inflammation in my body, uh, knees. I would just have different swelling at, at different times, would just swell up. Uh, and so um, at one particular time, was really having very, very uh, uh, bad problems with pneumonia. And um, actually my wife, <laughs> I was, she had reached a point that, uh, okay, we went to this walk-in clinic and this uh, doctor had looked at me after he examined me in the morning. He said, if you was an African-American, I would say that you had cystic fibrosis. And when I heard that, I said, oh, wow, oh, 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 wow. So throughout my journey, I just went on and went on, just reoccurring uh, uh, issues with the cystic fibrosis that was having problems with pneumonia, uh, chronic sinusitis. It was getting worse. It was just uh, manifesting itself in other different areas of my body. It's just really wreaked havoc in my digestive system. Uh, was able to get to a point that just can hold anything down for sure. Thank you. 
Terry, was that um, urgent clinic that you went to, was that kind of a turning point for you? Did you start looking into that at that point and really um, change the trajectory of what you were seeking as a diagnosis? Right, right, Amy. That was a big wake up call to me, uh, hearing that diagnosis. And then when I heard the diagnosis, then I was saying, well, there's not anyone that looked like Terry Wright out here mm -hmm that's carrying this diagnosis and me first time I'm hearing of it. So I said, okay, it's time to do something about this. Other people need to be aware of it. It's just not just uh, uh, Terry Wright, it's just many others out there just going up under the radar. And it's, it's time to uh, make a difference. Right. Right. That it strikes me that it was an, an urgent care provider who, who knew nothing else about you, who was just really an urgent care guy that you went to that was kind of the catalyst for you. Um, so thankful for that provider, for sure. Um, yeah. Everett, so your journey was a little bit different, but I suspect in some respects, um, growing up with CF and then getting through your early adult life um, with CF, um, what was that like for you? Oh, thank you, Amy. Um, it's interesting. Um, just quickly, um, you know, hearing uh, Tara's story, I, I just thought, well, my God, that could be my life. Um, if, you know, three things that didn't happen, that happened to me that didn't happen to Terry. Um, first thing is, as you said, I was diagnosed at nine. Um, but what I didn't tell you was I was, before that I was diagnosed with chronic as asthma. So I was already doing breathing treatments and I was already doing inhalers and I was already treating my lungs because I was having mass infections. So they knew something was there. Um, but the clicker and then the third part was I had a twin brother and it turned out that my twin brother was actually the catalyst for them finding my CF. Um, as you guys heard earlier, aesthetic fibrosis means that you're, 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 you're stunted. You don't, your growth is, is slow. You don't grow as much. But I look like an average person, but my twin brother is twice my size. So in my family, I'm a runt. And essentially my doctor, when I was having all these issues and I think for three months, I was going to the allergy clinic trying to figure out what is wrong with this kid. And my doctor was tenacious trying to figure out what was going on, which it appears Terry didn't have that. And I, I had a doctor who just kept asking questions, kept talking to people. And one day she was talking to the person who would become my doctor later. And she was saying, well, you know, his brother has none of these symptoms. And she was describing my brother. And he, she said to him, yeah, and he, he, he has no problems with malabsorption. He is He's like twice the kid's size and they're like almost, um, you know, two different people. And that spurred, that spurred um, thought in my ultimate doctor, who became my CF doctor later, that, hey, does this kid have CF because I had the lung problems and now I started having all these other symptoms that I, they, she just could not track down. And he connected the three. So um, I got diagnosed at five because I had a tenacious doctor. Um, she kept asking questions and I had a twin brother who denied SCF, who was, you know, twice my size. And literally that, those things led to my early diagnosis, which make me worry what would happen if I didn't have those things. So I'm, I'm kind of blessed for that because now I'm here. Right. And how, do, how was that like for you growing up? Was your, was it, do, do you have memories of your healthcare being a little bit different? Your providers kind of being surprised when they first took over your care? Not, so once my once they took over my care, uh, no, because then you get into the CF community, and I would I would share as much as I involved myself in the, the CF community back then. There was no others of color. I think I I didn't say there was none. There were very few, and so oftentimes people will be surprised later on when they figure out you have cystic fibrosis, and it it was you know i will get i i got a lot of different things came at me um oh you must be a mixed person which I, i'm a lighter a lighter tone skin tone so that was one um is your mother white or you know it was always something like that rather than the fact of realizing it doesn't really matter where it came from i still have it so it was more surprise for people in the community growing up um but it was never a situation where it it once they understood it with cf it changed everything it, the care change. Um, I've always had great care teams. My wife talks to me today. She says, everybody needs an FCF because you get better care if you have CF, if you go into the medical and go into your doctor. Um, I've been pretty lucky because of that. But if you don't have that, and I, when I hear stories of others, it really is disappointing. Um, and it could be, I mean, also, I hate to say that I'm in California where 
research. I was always around research. I was in study after study as a child, um, trying to learn more and more about CF, um, you know, taking all these experimental drugs. A lot of people in the countries don't have that, but I'm, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area with like two or three different medical institutions all doing research. Stanford is one of the top universities and hospitals um, for CF research. So I'm in one of the areas where they all do that. Um, and UC San Francisco was the other. So I was involved with both of those. So I was blessed in that way to have that type of environment around me. Unfortunately, too many people around the world and around the country don't have those, don't afford that same opportunity. Yep, I think you're right about that. Thank you for sharing that, Everett. Michelle, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and pick on you. Um, you don't have CF, but you do have lupus as Dr. Taylor talked about. And so you've had lupus for quite a while, but I suspect there were some, um, uh, some trials and tribulations for you in getting that diagnosis as well. What, what was that like for you? Uh, it was difficult and it was scary because you start to think that you're crazy. So I, I had a lot of looking back now, classic lupus signs. Um, my face had the butterfly rash. I lost a lot of weight. I was down to a, a, a small size um, four sets. Uh, I got to the point I could barely walk and people kind of thought it was just in my mind. And although I initially did not get the answers I was looking for, I continue. And then on Valentine's Day, I always say, where's the love? But on Valentine's Day of 1994, uh, 27 years this past Valentine's Day, I finally got the diagnosis. I can't say I was relieved like when Terry got the diagnosis of cystic fibrosis. I'm 54 now, I was 27 there and it was scary because when I heard the word lupus, it just, didn't, it just didn't sound good to me. Uh, I had a lot of severe issues. I had colon vasculitis. Um, I had to go on high dose um, steroids. I mentioned my butterfly rash to my face was actually deforming. It looked like third degree burns. So I didn't know if that was gonna heal. I got real, real depressed. Um, probably should have sought some um, emotional support. And then in an effort to save my life from the uh, vascular uh, colon vasculitis, they put me on high dose steroids. So I gained like 50 uh, pounds. My face became bloated and disfigured. Uh, but it, it was important to have the support of my family and friends. And this journey for the last 27 years have been a journey of life and life for the better. So I'm just glad to, to be here and help others in their walk like we do in cystic fibrosis as well. Yep, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that, Michelle. So Zafora, you're our only provider on the panel. And I think, um, I think Terry and Michelle have an interesting story, you know, of their diagnosis and, and the things that happened with them. And um, it always, those stories always bring me back and, and some of uh, Dr. Taylor Kassar's comments on health disparities, right? And so that's a really real problem. And if, if there's anything good that's come out of COVID, I think it's really raised awareness around health disparities and the uh, things that we need to do to put ourselves on a path to, to bridge those gaps. And so um, in your experience from a social work perspective, how do you advocate for patients or, or individuals in your community when you see that health disparities are a problem for them? Well, I have always worked in healthcare. And in the institution, I have always uh, positioned myself on committees or any kind of initiatives that are taking place, either to initiate or as a participant, as to help so that I can help the patients who come to our hospitals. And the, this is not only institution-wide. I also follow up in the community by joining grassroots organizations or working on a local level or state level or regional level to ensure that these health disparities are addressed so that people can get the help they need because it's not enough just to give resources and not address the core issues. And by advocating on a higher level, 
that would be able to affect some change. Thank you for that, Zephora. I appreciate that. It is a, um, I think it's the, the value of having providers uh, participate in any kind of community efforts to um, educate non-providers, to bring non-providers along, to help them understand and be a part of the solution is really, really important. And that takes a lot of personal um, dedication and your giving of yourself and your personal time. So thank you for that. And I'd also like to say being invited to be a, a board member of NOSA has been an honor and it's indeed a pleasure because I think I can further advocate for African-American or people of color who come to our uh, cystic fibrosis center. I would be in a better position to advocate by being a member of this board. Absolutely, I agree. I, I feel that the same personal way as a forest, so I can certainly relate to that. Um, Michelle and Terry, I'm gonna bounce back to you just a little bit um, because you guys obviously have a lot of medical care that you receive along the way. And um, in, in my uh, years with you, I, I've known that uh, your advocacy for one another is really, really important. Um, because lupus and CF is not who you are. It's, it's part of what drives your medical care, but um, it's, it, and it's a part of your journey. But there are other things that happen in life, other medical conditions that need attention. And so um, how, how do you manage to advocate for one another in those times when, when you're seeking care from other providers that may not be as familiar with your um, lupus and CF diagnoses and uh, really sometimes carry with them um, those unconscious biases that may, uh, you know, affect their ability to, to care for you in, a, in an unbiased way? Well, thank you. Thank you for that question. One thing Terry and I try to do is make sure when one is down, the other person is up. We try not to be down at, this, at the same time. And you do have to advocate and you advocate out of love not just for for your um, spouse, but for people in general. And uh, you know, one of the things we did to help advocate is to start our organization, the National Organization of African Americans with Cystic Fibrosis, because we didn't want his story to be in vain. So that pushed us by advocating for others to make it easier to even uh, advocate for ourselves. And I was fortunate because I have a pharmaceutical background. So I knew how to interact with the physicians and healthcare professionals. I knew how to ask those questions. And so it became, it, it became something that became second nature for me. So we, we go at it together. And uh, when he's sick, I feel like I'm sick. And when I'm down, he feels like he, um, he's down and we know that we have each other and it's something about knowing you're not in it alone and that somebody cares and that's what I'm hoping that Noah self is for everybody else we touch even beyond race we want to continue reaching beyond the diagnosis to advocate and make that difference is there anything? Right. And, <laughs> and, and you know one thing Amy whether you advocated for yourself or whether you have someone to advocate for you, it must be done. And, and that really helps me out tremendously to have my wife. It, I re can remember in a time that I was on my way actually out of here, mm -hmm. off this earth, but I had my wife was able to advocate, to speak the language, to speak the genre, to, to understand when I wasn't able to speak myself, maybe because I'm sedated or whatever reason, to have someone have that mouthpiece is just so important. Yeah, and I would, um, and, and Everett, prepare yourself because I'm going to bounce this question to you too. Um, advocacy is really important. So you just mentioned, Terry, the not having the ability to advocate for yourself. So I would wonder from your seat and you too, Michelle, what would you say to others? I mean, NOSF is going to really um, raise awareness for minorities around um, rare 
uh, and genetic diseases, right? That's part of the mission. And so just because we raise awareness doesn't mean that in the, in the general population, and we do it for providers, it doesn't mean we're going to do it for everybody, right? And so when we raise awareness in those individuals that are that really make them think and provoke them to ask their providers questions, hopefully, what's your advice to them to, to be a self-advocate? Um, not everybody has a, a partner or a teammate or somebody that's in their corner. So how, what would you, what words of advice would you give them? The words of advice I would give them, once you get that diagnosis, just educate yourself, uh, get in groups, uh, support groups, uh, uh, put the word out, just, just get educated, just get educated. And I would add, get involved. <laughs> get involved with the organization. Uh, it, it, it helps when you see people that look like you. It, it, it helps with the journey, but the communities of, of rare and genetic diseases are vast. So get involved in a multitude of diverse uh, communities. They don't have to just look like you. So get, get involved and like Terry said, get educated and know your own voice. If you have a physician, a healthcare professional, they are not listening to you, you have the wrong healthcare professional. So know the value of your own voice. And if you don't know how to advocate for yourself, reach out to those who do. You heard from two great physicians today. So they have platforms that can help you. So just reach out and um, reach out to people like a Dr. Amy Hester and those that's part of the board that can make a difference. If you can't, we will. <laughs> I like that. Thank you for that. And Everett, what would, what, what would be your, your advice? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I mean, I, I, first of all, let me just agree with what's already been shared. Um, and so not to be too redundant, you know, I, I kind of go with a couple of basic principles um, on that. One, first of all, is recognizing at the end of the day, um, regardless of you know, your doctors or anyone else, you, yourself, and yourself will always be your best advocate. Um, nobody can express how you feel. Nobody can understand what you're going through. They may sympathize, they may empathize. I have CF, I have friends and people who are very close to me who have CF, yet even our experiences are different. So you will always be, um, and, I, and this is not just related to CF, um, it's, you advocate for yourself in every situation. But in this situation, you are your best advocate. Um, the mm -hmm. second thing is never settle for guesses. The doctors and, and medical professionals do their best, but they're not infallible. And a lot of times in medicine, they're just trying to rule things out to get to the right answer. So never settle for a guess, keep searching for the right answer. The second thing about that is, and I, I, do, I do this, I, I, I appreciate my CF, my CF team. There's a group, it's not one doctor, there's an actual group of doctors. Um, but I still have my personal physician who is not connected with my CF, my CF group, who I use. And it's, it's, it's just because you wanna, you wanna double check and make sure um, that we're not missing something. And it's not, it's not, a, it's not questioning your doctor, it's just, hey, they may, they may look at things in one way, I just wanna have a second opinion who can just tell me something that's slightly different. And I, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell us a quick story, which I wasn't going to do, but I'm going to bring up my best friend, Ryan, who passed away in 1989. Um, and we moved, we moved together, we lived together at the time, and he died five months after moving to Sacramento. And he kept having all these issues, and his CF doctor kept treating him as if he was having CF issue complications. So it turned out he had a whole different complication. Now, he died from the CF, but the other sickness, the other illness that he was dealing with complicated the CF. And that is what actually, uh, unfortunately, what caused his death. And because of that, I realized our doctors do the best they can, but they're not infallible. And sometimes you need to have a double check. But that's why I, you always, you ask the questions. I still believe if somebody has a problem with you asking why, then they're not the right doctor for you. You need, if they can give you an answer and they, they have a problem with you asking questions, you need to think about somebody who's gonna work with you. I got diagnosed, why? Because the, the nurse practitioner, who was my primary at the time, would refuse to just guess at things. She went out of her way to find out what was wrong with me. And because she had her tenacity is why I got diagnosed when I did. So my encouragement is 
be tenacious for yourself. You can't always rely that your physician, your primary care person is going to be that person. And then the other thing that was mentioned by both Terry and Shell, get somebody who's a support who can who can be with you. It doesn't have to be your parent or your spouse. Uh, I have people who are so close to me that when I'm stressed and not sure what to do, I call them. And sometimes that little bit of encouragement is all I need. But there's always somebody to be in your corner if you open up to them and you bring them into your circle who you feel safe with. So those, those are the things I would do. But again, it's, at the end of the day, it's up to you. You always need to advocate for yourself, regardless of if it's CF or in other in environments. Always advocate for yourself. Yep. So I love the never settle for a guess. I think that could, you could have a, a motto there that could be on all kinds of things there, Everett. It's really true. And I, I think part of what you've really, uh, a theme that's kind of come out both from Zephora's response and her question, even though it was a different context and, and what um, you, Everett and Terry Michelle are saying is that it's important to be connected. It's important to have a network of friends and family. It's important to have a network of community. And so um, that connectedness um, can be very powerful. And I think if, if there's definitely something that I'm hearing from all of you that's, that's really similar, I would, I would bring that out at this point and just um, and, and highlight that. Um, I would also say that, that those statements about, you know, if somebody is not okay with you asking why, um, you're, you're not with the right provider. And I think you're right about that. Um, I also think that um, something that's really uh, come to light in the presence of the, um, the enlightenment of the health disparities, I think is also unconscious bias, right? And we all have them um, around all kinds of things, but they're certainly very alive and, and well in, in healthcare. Uh, Zephora, you and I have had conversations about that. So I would ask you, you know, from a provider standpoint, um, how do you help, you know, from provider to provider, I guess, which is also really important. Um, how do you help your colleagues deal, uh, one, identify, and then two, deal with unconscious bias that they may have? Well, I have the discussion with them. You know, we have to have the dialogue. And by having the dialogue, I can educate my colleagues. And I'll just give you an example. I was in a workroom at the hospital and I overheard, uh, the providers were not speaking to me, but I overheard a clinician and a doctor stating that African-American people have a higher tolerance uh, for pain. Hmm. You know, and um, I injected myself into the conversation. You know, that, that what they were saying it's just, you know, where are you getting this information from? There are millions of African-American people. Are uh, you telling me that all African-American people have a high tolerance for pain? So, you know, I have to, con I confronted it respectfully and, you know, it turned into a longer dialogue. And then I further brought it up in a quality uh, improvement session where we got into talking about racism and every, you know, all of these topics. And then I found out the person who was initiating this um, said she grew up in the South. She hasn't had much experience with African-American people and it went on and on. And it goes to the definition of unconscious bias where people have these ingrained stereotypes and, and beliefs about other people, not just about race, it's also about socioeconomics, um, you know, providers referring to people of lower socioeconomic groups as uh, they are a mess, you know, because they miss appointments or whatever, you know, and this, it's, a, it's work, it's always, you know, work and re-education, but that's the way I do it, by confronting it and education and re-education. Right, so that takes a, um... It takes a big heart and it takes putting yourself in an uncomfortable situation. Absolutely. And so um, I think that if you had to define advocacy, that would be something that would filter up under both of those. So as we talk about those advocacy conversations, I think that really um, highlights that um, you can be an advocate in many ways, right? It's not just an advocate for your spouse. It's not just an advocate for your friends and, and you know, in, in your connected network. It's really... Um, advocacy for communities in general and advocacies for the right thing and advocacies not only uh, you're also advocating for those 
clinical providers too. You're making sure that you are reinforming their misinformation. And that takes thoughtfulness. And you talked about that respectful way to do that. I think um, even as providers, you can be very, um, you can be highly educated, but not know how to tactfully have or approach a crucial or a difficult conversation. And so um, I think sometimes that inhibits people from uh, taking that next step. And so um, uh, thank you for that advocacy and making sure that uh, you're reinforming those that are misinformed. But it, it definitely is something that is, uh, I think when we talk about health disparities and unconscious bias, I'm not sure that you can have uh, a conversation of one without the other sometimes. They always seem to, to creep into the same conversation. So thank you for sharing that. Um, uh, and then I would, we've got just a couple more minutes to close out the conference um, before Michelle, your closing comments. And I would, I would ask each of you, Terry, I'll start with you and then I'll go to Michelle and then I'll go to Everett and then I'll, I'll finish back out with you, Zephora. If there are any other thoughts that you want to, to leave this group with or, um, uh, you know, just lasting messages that you want to, that, that you want to have, I'll, I'll kind of open end it to you and let you have that. Yes, we're, we're having these conversations, uh, even though uh, sometimes conversations could be uncomfortable, but I think we need to have these conversations. It, it, it needs to be heard if there's a difference going to be made. Repetitious, repetitious, repetitious. That's my only advice. Mm -hmm. I will add, don't feel like your diagnosis uh, defines, your, defines you. It's, it's easy to look for the worst in your diagnosis. Look for the best. Look how you can go out and touch the life of someone else. I mean, we're living proof. It has not been easy. Uh, we, we can have a whole conference about everything we've gone through with cystic fibrosis and, and lupus, even me developing a vascular necrosis from taking um, long-term steroids. But find, find the light at the end of the tunnel and know that you are not alone and that there's physicians out there who care, like your Dr. Jennifer taylor Cowsers, your Dr. Jason Taylors, your doc, Dr. Amy Hester's, and there's organizations like the National Organization of African Americans with Cystic Fibrosis, who's here to make a difference in your life. Just stay encouraged and don't give up because the best is yet to come. That's right. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm just gonna echo a little bit of what's already been said um, with this. Um, it took me a while to realize this, so I'm just gonna share it. You are more than your diagnosis. You are more than CF. You are more than whatever you're dealing with. You're more than that. So you have as a part of who we are, but it's not, it doesn't define who we are. So that, so, you know, we can talk about treatments, we can talk about medical stuff, but never forget that you are more than just your, your CF and don't let anyone ever tell you and put you into that pigeonhole of that's who you are. That's a part of you, but you're more than that. And you can, and you can accomplish anything when you realize you're not, you're not defined by what somebody else calls you or defined you as. Thank you for that. Sephora? And just to pig, piggyback on what Everett said, you know, I always tell providers and people that our patients are not just the sum of their illness. There's so much more to our patients than, you know, their diagnosis or their illness. And I would say that um, people should not be just passive bystanders. Get involved. You know, we are our brother's keepers. You know, we have to look out for one another. You know, when you see, in the words of uh, John Lewis, when you see something, say something, do something. You know, I was raised with a sense of civic responsibility that we all have to pitch in and help out each other. And that has gotten me into social work and has carried me through. And I will continue to do this. Thank and you. Thanks again, Michelle, for accepting me in NOSA. Thank you. Yep, absolutely. And with that, with that, thanks to Michelle. I'll, I'll pass it back to you, Michelle, and thank our panel members very much for.
for letting me pick on you a little bit today for for sharing your stories for being transparent and open sometimes that in and of itself is hard but that sharing really um, helps and it helps make those connections for those that may be struggling um, to do that so um, I personally appreciate that and I'm sure many others do too and thank you Dr. Amy Hester for also being my mentor. <laughs> so I truly uh, appreciate you. Wow. <laughs> what an awesome event, Terry. <laughs> it sure was, Butterbean. Hey, Terry, Butterbean is our secret. Oops, I'm sorry. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> and with that, we now come to the conclusion of our first ever BioMerge conference but yet the beginning of Noah Self's continued focus on Blacks, Indigenous, and other minority ethnicities with rare and genetic diseases, because the BioMerge Conference will continue to take place on an annual basis and will continue to feature new rare and genetic diseases each conference. But this could not have been possible without all of our beautiful diamonds that helped to make this happen. I love and can appreciate the saying, diamonds need not explain how radiant they are. They just keep shining. Whoever should admire their brilliance will find their way to them. And we are so grateful to find our way to everyone today that have been an integral part of this. So in honor of Terry and my appreciation to our Rare Diamond inaugural Noah Cell, four members, as well as our precious Diamond inaugural BioMerge participants, we have a special surprise that we wanted to present each of you. So we present each of you with your very own inaugural Diamond of Appreciation. Um, oh, wait a minute, I'm gonna have to take the background off, I'm sorry. But you may not be able um, um, to see it, but, um, oh, maybe you can. But thank you. Thank you. Uh, each of you, including our esteemed speakers, Dr. Taylor Kowser and Dr. Jason Teller, get their own inaugural speaking diamond award as well. So uh, each, and every one of our board members, our esteemed speakers will get that because you are a diamond to us. You're not just any diamond, you're a priceless diamond. We also wanna make sure that we encourage everyone that's watching now or uh, that will watch to please sow diamonds and seeds of love in our organization by going to our website. You can see it right here knowitself.org coming down on the side, but just in case you can't, it is n-o-a-c-l.org. And you can make a donation on the homepage. You can make a donation uh, via PayPal credit card, or you can even send in a check. And that's important to us because every penny and dollar count, because we want to make a difference in the lives of others. And while you're on the website, make sure you go to the tab that says Terry's journey to CF land. I know it's hard to see here, but you can see it real nice on the website. Pick up your own copy. And the nice thing about the coloring book, the uh, coloring will, uh, the children will appreciate the opportunity to color, but the parents and the loved ones will appreciate the story. So also do check back. We're gonna make sure that this recording is posted to our um, website, this historical and phenomenal event, alongside a lot of more exciting news and information to come. Because like I always say, the best is yet to come. This conference wouldn't have taken place today without you. We thank you, we appreciate you, and God bless each and every one of you.